You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 60 of the Common Descent Podcast. Hey, we like reptiles here. A little bit. And we've talked about parts of pretty much all the major groups of reptiles. We talked plenty about snakes, crocs, some lizard talk. We've mentioned dinosaurs a whole bunch. We have not yet talked very much about, on this podcast, what are probably the weirdest reptiles maybe ever. Yeah, I mean, they they have a pretty good claim to the title. Today's topic is turtles. We're back on reptiles. As with so many of our other episodes, this is going to be just an overview of the group. We're going to look at what turtles are like today. We are going to look at some of the most mysterious and confusing aspects of their evolution, which is to say their evolution. All of it. And hopefully we're going to make a lot of listeners very happy because this is one... I did, I've actually compared it, but de- <laughs> one of the most requested topics on the podcast. People like turtles. This topic has been requested by uh, our patron Cheryl, as well as... Jonathan Jaster, Timon, Matthew, Tut, Austin, Bella, and Don and Hans, who are two folks who have po- posited turtles as contenders. To oh, when yeah. we do our polls, there are they, they these two these two folks those upstarts with their third party write in candidate, which is not how the poll works. No, we we are in America. It is a two party system. <laughs> <laughs> Now, more on turtles in a bit. First, a couple of announcements. As always, we uh, give shout-outs to patrons uh, at our Patreon who subscribe Mm -hmm. at a certain level. The podcast is largely uh, supported by the donations we get on Patreon. This episode, we are welcoming Madeline. Or Madeline. I don't. It could be either one. It's spelled the way that Madeline from the book is, Uh, I believe. Whichever way you say it, we welcome both of you. Twelve little girls in two straight lines. All twelve of you. (laughs) We're very happy to have you. Thank you very much. As usual, if you'd like to support the podcast in a more financial sense, check us out on Patreon. There's also a store now, which you can find the link to in the description for the episode. With uh, buttons and stickers as per uh, one of our listeners' requests who went to check on them. Oh, nice. Also, (laughs) I noticed we have a bunch of new reviews, like iTunes reviews, some of which are really cool. So thanks to everybody who leaves us reviews. Those are very helpful. Thanks. But let's let's move on quickly, uh, before we get to our main event, to some news. Will, as you know, as our long-term listeners know, every episode we pick some news from the world of paleontology, evolution, and the like... And we talk about it here on the podcast. So go ahead and talk about it here on the podcast. Well, before we get into these allegedly, you know, other best reptiles, I would like to talk about crocodiles, just to remind everyone. That they're the second best reptiles. That they are the winners of the annual polls for best reptile. Hashtag not my polls. (laughs) <laughs> david did indeed put together the polls <laughs> you're very true i did sometimes we are all sometimes our creations disappoint us <laughs> this is a news article a, a research about the death roll behavior in crocodilians what's that so the death roll it's probably one of the most famous things that documentaries always like to zoom in particularly on the nile crocodile and that's one of the things we'll get into. It is a behavior that crocodilians use to mostly kill and dismember their prey to eat. Because our modern, at least, crocodilians don't have teeth for cutting or slicing or not really even crushing. They just have good teeth for holding, with little spikes. So when they take down something too big for them to swallow, there's no way for them to delicately or expertly take it apart so the only option they have is to tear it apart and there's other ways they can do it a lot of them just 
shake their head. They just whip it. Right, thrash around. Until the part in their mouth stays in their mouth and the rest of it goes that way. <laughs> but the other option, especially for animals, uh, for the crocodiles going after really big prey like wildebeest, they grab onto a hunk of the meat and then they spin their body. They rotate it by spinning their tail like a propeller and twist it off. It's awesome and terrifying. They And they can do it fast. Like, they can make multiple revolutions a second. It's impressive. Well, the question asked by the researchers here is, how many species can do it? Because we know, famously, things like the uh, Nile crocodile and alligator do it, but we don't see it in a lot of other species, and it often was claimed that some don't. So they wanted to look into it. The research we'll be looking into is by Stephanie Drumheller et al. in Ethology, Ecology, and Evolution. And the article we'll be linking to is by Andrea Schneibel, and it's from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville News. So, this death roll is something that we know very well in certain species, but at least do not know of particularly in others. So, the researchers decided to put to test who can and can't death roll. And they went to St. Augustine Alligator Farm, which is one of the only places in the world where you can find all the recognized species of crocodilian in the world today, Very which is cool. wonderful. And where that's in Florida, right? Yes. That's by you? It's in Florida, a little ways from us here, and it's where they do a lot of the cool... It's where um, Erickson did the big bite test where they got bite measurements ah. for every single species. and So they, they do this kind of stuff a lot because... If you need to compare them all quickly, that's the place to go. I believe there's a place in Europe as well that uh, touts having all the species. But they went through to test. And what they were really wanting to look for was the slender snouted varieties typically have been considered not to do it. Uh, mostly because they're often going for small prey. You don't need to death roll a frog or a fish. Right. So it was just kind of... It has been considered that they didn't do it. To test it, they used two techniques. One was the feeding technique, which was they would throw a, what they called feeding rotation. They would throw a piece of food, and then they would provide resistance to the food once the croc, the crocodilian grabbed a hold of it. So something that they had to now twist against if they wanted to get a hold of the food. The other was the escape rotation, which is another way the death roll can be used, is when they are grabbed, they can often spin to try to get out of the grapple. Or even whilst fighting, they will use that death roll on other crocs. Uh, I've, I've seen many a video of them twisting limbs oh, yeah. off of competitors. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not nice. For that one, they would catch them with a snare. You know, a very common way of catching a croc or an alligator is snaring them with a, a lasso or a, a pole and seeing if they try to twist away to get out of it. Uh, the baby alligators of the aquarium do this all the time when we pick them up. They don't succeed in the death roll, but whilst I pick them up, you can see their tail rotating. Yep. They're trying to spin out of my hand. I'm just holding them too well. And they found of the 25 recognized modern species, you know, there's debates for other subspecies and whatnot, but for the 25 that they tested, 24 showed the behavior. Whoa, I have questions. Yes, the only one that didn't was Cuvier's dwarf caiman, Paleosuchus paleobrosus. Hmm. And that also could have just been that it wasn't cooperating. Right, right, yeah. right. They but only at, had at least the 24 individual. of them. Yes. At least 96%. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so majority of modern species are capable. They may not do it much, but they can. They showed at least one of the two. Interesting. This suggests potentially that the death roll behavior is ancestral. That this is something shared because it's shared across crocodilia at least. Now, does it go back? pass to the crocodile morphs into the the more distant relatives hard to say but at least for crocodilia it's shared so it might be able to be supposed that closer and you know related ancestors with a similar body shape you know we might not be able to suspect that or expect that the 
longer legged or more terrestrial ones would still be doing this because this is very reliant on a tube like body. Right. But it could be a very ancestral trait. And they also point out may not be primarily feeding. It could have started out yeah, for the yeah, escape yeah. method and then co-opted for feeding later on. This brings to mind two things. Number one, I saw this poster at SVP years ago. I don't remember if this was 2017. Okay, because if it was, we may have talked about this actually on episode 17. Oh, right. Yeah. Where we, we talked about SVP. I yeah. don't remember. Some of our listeners will have to tell us. But I remember I saw this er in an earlier mm -hmm, stage of the mm -hmm. research that Stephanie presented. That's very cool. Also, I think it was on our last Q&A where somebody t asked us to speculate about snakes that evolved convergently with crocs and crocs that evolved convergently with snakes. Mm -hmm. Those snake, those croc snakes would totally do a death oh, absolutely roll. they would. Because if you ever got, if you can look this up, look up um, river eels feeding. Because uh, first off, there's such thing as river eels. And there's sure ones is. that will like feed on carcasses and they death roll. They grab and they, now they spin ridiculously and a snake would be better at death rolling than a croc or at least it'd be faster yeah if it was a if it was a stout you know sturdy snake it could rotate way quicker because it's just a tube but like yeah they would absolutely death roll very cool behavioral <laughs> just behavioral phylogeny just where where on the tree does this behavior take place it's just super fun that's i i always find that so interesting now there's always you know, you always have to put the caveat, eh, convergence is always potentially lurking. Right, right. But this would be very heavy convergence. The fact that, that even the gharial, even the gharial death rolls. Yes, yeah. with its long <laughs> toothpick snout. So that's, that's high support that this is something that the ancestors to Crocodilia did, which is cool. Well, speaking of apex predators... <laughs> My next bit of news is about a particularly large carnivore from the Miocene, newly discovered that sheds light on an interesting group of ancient carnivores. This is research by Matthew Borths and Nancy Stevens, published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, and we'll link to an article in National Geographic by Catherine Zuckerman. The new carnivore is named Simbakubwa Kuto Kafrika. It cool. dates to about 22 million years old, which is the Miocene of Kenya. Its name means, apparently, big lion in Swahili, but it is not a lion. Not even that close. <laughs> it belongs to a group called the Hyenodonts. Oh, I love these. Which are also not hyenas. <laughs> They're not actually carnivorans, like, you know, most of our mammal carnivores, bears, lion, bears, cats, dogs, etc., belong to the order Carnivora. This is part of a separate group, traditionally, uh, I believe, classified as creodonts. So a, a different evolutionary group of big carnivores. These, in fact, are a, a interesting study subjects because they are hyper carnivores, which means special that means you're not not like a bear right a grizzly bear can eat whatever it wants yes it's a carnivore but it can also eat plants hyper carnivores are exclusively or very near exclusively meat hunting no veggies no veggies this group of carnivores were once found across europe north america asia africa all over the world they were the dominant predators before carnivorans so by the, the end of the Miocene, this group of animals, the hyenodonts, were pretty much done. And our modern carnivorans, cats and canids and such, were on the rise. This new species is reportedly the oldest known hyenodont, and perhaps the largest. Ooh. There is a photo in this article of the lower jaw of this animal sitting next to a an African lion's skull, and the jaw is bigger than the skull. <laughs> wow. They estimate the weight, the body mass, of this animal at up to 1,500 kilograms, or 3,300 pounds, which I found out recently, for reasons you will learn in just a little bit, that is roughly the size of the world's largest living rhinos. This was a rhino-sized 
Predator. That's that's uncalled for. That's what that is. Well, you know what else is uncalled for? Carnivorans today, one of the defining features of carnivorans is their teeth. Well, I mean, mammals, it's always teeth. But specifically, the group carnivorans, uh, weasels, skunks, raccoons, bears, cats, dogs, have a pair of teeth called carnasials. This is an upper premolar and a lower molar, which fit together like giant scissor blades for shearing. It's this very specialized two teeth that work together top and bottom, one pair on each side. If you've ever watched your cat, like, chew on a, a toy or, for my cats, the handles off of plastic bags, <laughs> when they go outside, to, they take their cheek to it and, 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 yep. and dogs that's do what they're too. doing. And it's, when they bite on a bone, it's at the, they're using those yep. carnasials in the back. It's super cute from the outside, horrifying what's actually going on. <laughs> Hyenodonts, including this monstrosity, had three pairs of carnasials. <laughs> Why? Three teeth on top and bottom on either side of the jaw for a total of six pairs of carnasial teeth. They were just, in, in the words of, I believe this was the lead author... A lot of blades. <laughs> wow. Now, what's exciting about this animal, in addition to just being super big and awesome, is understanding more about them. So, so a lot of the remains of this group of animals are very fragmentary. Having more material that we can compare between the different species gives us a better sense of what they were like, what they were doing, and can help us to understand how these kinds of groups arose and fell specialized animals are usually most susceptible during times of environmental change. Apex predators and hypercarnivorous animals are especially in danger because once the ecosystem starts falling apart, you, the, 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 if you're at the top of the pyramid, you're going to feel that shaking foundation before anybody else. Yeah, literally anywhere in the food chain that something gets on, you are going to feel it because it all leads up to you. We're looking at you, polar bears. Oh, oh. I've been yeah. watching Our Planet. My oh. friend my friend got me to watch the Frozen Worlds episode the other day. Oh, it's... Yep. Ooh. Ooh. Yep. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm only partway through Our Planet right now. I gotta get, pick it back up. But anyway, hey, there's a big cool animal that can teach us about how animals come and go. Woo! I always... First off, it's always cool when we get big mammalian predators. Yes. Uh, because, like, we have big mammal predators today, but... They're nowhere near the size of our big mammals, like right, except right, for the, right. like the orca. But even that's still not comparable to the other big marine mammals. Yes, like we have big predators today, but they're not they're not as big as we know predators got, especially in other groups. You know, we don't we don't have any forty foot you know cats, <laughs> and we don't have any you know elephant sized. Uh, uh, dogs, but when we do get a big mar mammal predator, it's always interesting to see how they're shaped, because they're always, I don't know, to me, they always look disproportioned to what you would expect, because it's not, it doesn't fit with what we think of as predators today. I believe that this this one, they actually said, I think it was, again, the, the it was in the article somewhere, where they said that it would have looked weird. It had its head was too big, and it would have been sort of weirdly proportioned compared to what we're familiar with. And that's that's very interesting to me. Also, this one I like because it sounds like it was designed in spore, where it's not, <laughs> like you gave someone a base design of like, all right, here's a basic mammal predator, and I'm teaching you how to use it. How do you want to make? All right, well, I'm gonna make its head bigger. Oh, okay. And uh, I'm just gonna copy these teeth. And what what if what if it was a rhino that was a predator? And then I'm gonna grab the corner and just keep going. <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's yeah, that's really neat. Cool. Well, how about a teeny tiny predator next? Okay. I have an article about a very old, uh, well, medium old crab that is a weird crab okay are there normal crabs oh uh, well, i compared the other crabs would think it was weird <laughs> <laughs> weird compared to crabs this is it it has crab-like traits but then it also has a whole bunch of things that 
we don't see really in other crabs. This is a study by Javier Luc in Science Advances, and the article it will be a National Geographic article by Michael Greshko. This is a new fossil from a site in Colombia that dates back to mid-Cretaceous, about 90 million years ago. And it's a noteworthy site. So the site itself is also being announced in this you know, study and, and kind of uh, it, its uh, debut. It is oh, a high, cool. uh, yeah, I really like it. It's a high detail preservation. They were saying that shrimps down to a millimeter in length are preserved. Wow. In this site. So lots of marine material, very high detail. And this new crab, which is not rare in the site, they found dozens of this specimen and or individual specimens of this species, is a new species that is Cali Chimera perplexa, which is the puzzling, beautiful chimera. That's great. Isn't that a great name? That's a good name. And part of the reason is because this crab has features. Some features are crabby. It has claws and it has... Some things that do show up in crabs, but usually not adult crabs. So this is a, as far as they can tell, a active swimming crab. So open water swimming crab, not scuttling. And there are swimming crabs today, but it doesn't look like those. This crab had a, what they call a fusiform body. So it was shaped more like a, like a submarine than the little oval. Like a shark. You know, yes, like a shark. So this was a, a tube-like crab. Shark crab. Instead of the squat bodies that most crabs have for sitting on the bottom. Large compound eyes. Like big ping pong ball looking eyes on the front of the face. Not on stalks. Just sitting there on the face. Which you see in larva crab, but not typically in the adults. Its tail is not tucked under the body. It is sticking out back. Kind of like a shrimp where the tail's out instead of tucked under. It had mouth parts that were more reminiscent of legs, so not the little closed-in mouth parts that crabs have. And then it had paddle-like legs, which swimming crabs have today. But on a swimming crab today, their paddles are the back pair of legs. These were the front two pair of legs. I'm pretty sure you're just describing Anomalocaris. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's this weird... And it looks like it was an active predator. It looks like it had big, good vision for those big eyes claws and active swimming to hunt stuff in the open water that is a weird crab it's a weird crab it also has a unique shell pattern among living and fossil crabs so it's weird even among weird fossil things this is something that there this is not like a origin to crabs it's just showing that there was a vast variety of crabs in the fossil record that we're still discovering that crabs had a huge amount of variety and some of it was outside of anything we'd expect. They do want to look into some of the features because the trait with the eyes could hint at something we call pediomorphosis, which is uh, retention, re uh, keeping your juvenile, your baby traits into adulthood. Right. So this, I, I believe we talked about that in episode 33. Yes, indeed. I, we did. So they're, they're thinking that this crab might have taken its baby larva eyes into adulthood to use them for its new lifestyle. It also suggests that certain crabby features, like the large claws and the presence of swimming appendages, even though these are different limbs, are something that's been well-defined within the crab group for at least 90 million years. So that, that suggests that those are pretty strong traits. Or there's at least a, a long background for them. The only other thing they kind of suggest about it is with the size of the eyes, it might have been nocturnal. Or at least hunting in dark areas. And and really, from here, it's just observing and trying to figure out more about this weirdo. And just kind of announcing that crabs have had a lot of weirdness. And some of it we're still finding. I like that this essentially is serving as a proof of concept of this new fossil site. Yeah. Where it's like, hey, everyone, we didn't have time. Like last episode, we talked about that Cambrian site, that new site that had all these these cool things. This one's like, well, I didn't have time to identify 101 species. Here's one. Stay tuned. 
Yeah, here's the weirdest crab you ever saw. It's the um <laughs> the pilot episode for this site. Yes. <laughs> That's great. That's And very, if you'd very like cool. to see more, here's yep. the the Here. box for my funding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, here's my <laughs> here's my GoFundMe page. Yes, yes. <laughs> very neat. Well, I'm going to take it back to the land. I'm going to take us to a very familiar fossil site, the Gray Fossil Site. For yeah, my I've heard of news. it. Our listeners have certainly heard of it, uh, unless this is the <laughs> first time you're ever listening to our podcast, because we mention it all the what? dang time. Yeah, you're going to hear about it now, too. And now you're going to hear about it here. <laughs> We've talked about the Gray Site quite a bit. For those of you who, who are unfamiliar, it is a Miocene-Pliocene boundary time uh, aged site, uh, about 5 million years old. Right here where I am in East Tennessee, famous for all sorts of cool, exciting new species like the red panda, the wolverine, a certain snake that is pretty dang cool. It's a pretty good snake. But notably, there have not yet been any large animals named as new species thus far until now. A few of our friends have finally, after long last, published the rhino. Which is so, so cool. It's it's so cool. Now, this is research published by Rachel Short, Stephen Wallace, and Laura Emmert in the Bulletin of the Florida Museum of Natural History. Rachel and Laura are both grad student were both grad students at the same time as myself and Will, so we overlapped with them. So these are friends of ours. Yes. Uh, and Dr. Wallace is one of the professors over there. Rachel started working on this as her master. So the story of the rhino at the Gray Fossil Site is that in the year 2000, the first bits of rhino were discovered way back. And it was one of the first animals that was like a big deal when people discovered it. And they said, okay, this is a weird site. There shouldn't be rhinos around here. This is not what we originally thought it was, along with some other animal. And, you know. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> <laughs> you had your time. <laughs> And then in 2004 through 2006, they excavated two pretty much complete skeletons. Yeah, like unnecessarily complete. <laughs> <laughs> they became affectionately known as Little Guy and Big Boy, uh, professionally known as ETMNH 609 and 601. Little Guy was missing one, let me see, I'm going to get this right, hind left lateral distal phalanx. One toe bone not one toe no the the last bone of three in one of its toes it's the only element missing in the skeleton it was literally missing so little that had in life we removed that toe bone the rhino still would have been fine yes like it wouldn't 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 have been a problem this is like if you lost the front joint of your pinky toe yep that's insane (laughs) then in 2011 Our friend Rachel joined at the Gray Fossil site and began, or at the, at ETSU and began her master's thesis on the rhino. And the completeness of these specimens allowed them to create, to, to put together a, what they call in the paper, a bone by bone description of the rhino. Now, folks, I have to take the little caveat where both Will and I both know the site. We know these people. These are friends of ours. All that aside, This is a beautiful paper. (laughs) There is a fig. Every element in this rhino is represented in a figure in this paper. They literally go through the entire skeleton. It's so cool. It's just it's just such beautiful paleontology. And it's a new species, which we knew. Like we've been saying it for we we slash they have been saying for almost 20 years now. This rhino is weird. This is going to be a new species. It was one of those where when we'd walk by it, it, we'd be basically like, this is a rhino. It's going to be a new rhino. It's just... Right. When when we can (laughs) finally get it published. It's in the works. And now it's not. Which is so wonderful. This is a rhino that belongs to a group called the Barrel-Chested Rhinos, the genus Teleoceros, which were widespread across North America. They they looked a lot like hippos. They were short, short legs, round bodies. They had little or no horn. They had tusks, you know, big, big lower, uh, I think they're incisors. There are some of the incisors Mm -hmm, that that mm -hmm. form these big sort of like pig, like hog tusks on the the lower jaw. Self-sharpening and scary. They're terrifying. Still sharp, even after five million years. 
So they were these sort of hippo-like rhinos that were well known for roaming the plains, eating grass across North America. But <laughs> this rhino was not doing that. The new rhino is named Teleoceros apisoma, and it is unique for a few features. Number one, it was a browser. We've done uh, previous research has done isotope analyses and found that it is a browsing rhino. Number two, it has unusually long front legs for Teleoceros, which gave it a higher stance. So it would have held its head a little higher. It was also very big. Rachel et al. included uh, size estimates in the paper. Now, there is a Teleoceros down in Florida, Proterum, that I believe, if I remember correctly, was estimated at around 700 kilograms. So like 1,500 pounds, you know, thereabouts. Their weight estimate in this paper for Big Boy is around 3,000 pounds. Wow. Which is comparable to the largest rhinos today. Or that giant hyena don we just talked about. <laughs> so these were big, tall, forest-dwelling, browsing rhinos. They've jokingly referred to it for a long time as the long-legged, short-legged rhino. <laughs> it's also the forest-dwelling plains rhino. So it's this, it's this really weird animal. It's super cool. I love it. It also uh, hints at some ecological specialization. Because if you've heard us talk about the gray site... This was a site where there was a lot of browsing competition. There were a lot of tapers. And I have this image in my head now of this rhino just raising its head a little bit. It's just, it's got access to that extra foot above a sea of tapers that were going after leaves and such around it. I could also picture them like picking up the fallen debris around underfoot of this rhino as it's as it's shaking the branches and pulling <laughs> stuff out and stuff's falling out of its mouth they're just picking up at its toes i put together a diagram of the skeletons of our taper rhino and mastodon next to and you can very clearly see vertical partitioning yes where the lower level is tapers the rhinos in the middle and then the mastodons browsing up top niche partitioning is always cool but the fact that it can happen within a forest just based on the height of the plants is yeah. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, and I should mention, this is also at four and a half to five million years ago, one of the last rhinos in North America. They went extinct uh, yeah. right around after this time. So real cool for all sorts of reasons. Oh, and I didn't, I didn't actually mention the article we'll link to because it doesn't exist yet. We will be <laughs> linking to the press release probably. Um, that will be released by ETSU, which will be written by me, and in fact is already written by me as of this <laughs> recording, but I'm not exactly sure when it's going to be out. So one way or another, there'll be a link to, uh, to either the press release, which is from the most reliable source out there, or if, you know, somebody else writes something real cool, maybe I'll, maybe we'll post that. Will, I have a surprise. <gasps> surprise! One, one more bit of news. Surprise oh, news. Boy. Tiny, oh, boy. Real, real quick, real quick, because Will's always doing this. You listeners, you know, you've been around. Will always, he does this thing where he's like, well, there's Crocs in the news. And I'm talking about Crocs. <laughs> well, two can play at this game. Research in the Journal of Archaeological Science by Eleanor Sonderman et al. Article by George Dvorsky and Gizmodo reports a 1,500-year-old human poop from Texas, a rock shelter in Texas, that contained within it vegetation. Mm -hmm. rodent remains all right and a surprising amount of a rattlesnake <laughs> which is really any amount any now, amount is surprising that, <laughs> which is apparently not true apparently snakes found in human diets in the archaeological record are fairly common however they are usually taken apart because you only want to eat the meat this was a viper most likely a rattlesnake some sort of viper they found 11 ribs, 11 vertebrae, 48 scales, and one fang huh. in this old human poop, which raises this incredible question of what in the world was this human doing eating apparently an entire rattlesnake? And they suggest that it was probably not a normal dietary thing, but it might have been ritualistic since this is from uh... a, a culture that had, you know, snakes were important symbols for them. 
Uh, that makes sense. Which makes me imagine the thing that, like, you know, when, like, frat guys or whatever would, like, swallow goldfish whole. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yep. That makes much more sense than my suggestion of paleo fear factor. <laughs> well, I mean, what's really the difference? <laughs> yeah, right. That's, I mean, I, I mean we're pretty, it's pretty similar. All right. To make the crops grow this season, you have to eat a rattlesnake. Da, da, da. <laughs> So there you go, real quick. We'll throw that up on the, on the the blog post along with the others. But that's enough about the best groups of reptiles. Let's talk <laughs> about another one. Let's talk about the we. They're so weird. Will they're so weird? <laughs> I'm very excited to talk about turtles. Will, do you have much experience with turtles? I, I have a decent amount. I will, I have not done research, but I hold them on almost a daily basis. What do you have at the aquarium? We have a Gulf Coast box turtle, a Florida box turtle, two red-eared sliders. Uh, so those are the ones I get to pick up. Okay. We have, throughout the aquarium, a green turtle, a uh, green sea turtle, loggerhead sea turtle, Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, and two alligator snapping turtles, some... Um, terrapins and then some yellow belly some map turtles and a couple nice. of cooters and then some soft shells that's it we had a few turtles at the science center i worked at in new york we had a there we had a little uh, a tortoise we had a couple of side necked turtles snake necked snake neck turtles yes which are so cool and we have a friend steve steve who uh steve jasinski actually dr steve jasinski who <gasps> yeah yeah there you go who cool. does research on turtles, and I used to follow him around when he was doing a turtle mm -hmm. trapping project. So we got to look for sliders and painted turtles, and we had some run-ins with common snapping turtles. Oh my gosh, they're so nasty. Turtles are very strange, very iconic reptiles. They're really interesting because it's it's funny because all the other reptiles and amphibians and such, people often will confuse them, call them by each other's names. Yeah. You don't do that with turtles. Nope. Let's talk about turtles. Turtles are weird today. They've been weird in the past. They are this just remarkable, diverse group uh, and a very ancient group of reptiles, and they are full of evolutionary conundrums. I feel like how weird they are gets overlooked just because of how used to turtles being a thing we are. Indeed. I would agree with that. We, we are used to turtles being turtles, but we don't actually notice how bizarre they are. So I'm going to tell you why turtles are just freaking bizarre. In the world today, according to the latest estimates by the reptile on the reptile database, there are around 350 living species of turtles. So for comparison, there's 25 or so of crocs, and yep. then snakes and lizards number like nine or 10,000 together. Gratuitous amount. N not enough, I say. <laughs> there are around 14 or so living families of turtles. Lots of extinct families that are not around anymore. Turtles can be found basically everywhere in the world except for the poles. So they have a very similar distribution to lizards. You can yeah. find them mo most parts of the world except the poles. They range from terrestrial. So you've got, you know, little like gopher tortoises and box turtles. Yeah. Oh, we have those too. All the way up to giant tortoises, right? the famous island Galapagos and the Seychelles giant tortoises uh more extinct uh species of giant tortoises as well there used to be lots of them now yeah. there are very few of them because they are large animals on islands and that's what happens when they're evidently tasty there are sea turtles very famously who which are specially adapted for marine living sea turtles have true flippers like mm -hmm. dolphins like uh, seals and sea lions have they are adapted for living in the salt water. Uh, some of the largest animals, some of the largest turtles in the world today are sea turtles. In fact, the largest turtle, the, the record for largest turtle today is the leatherback at about two meters long. <laughs> Six and a half feet or so and weighing around a ton. They're massive. That's a huge, that's the size of a small car. Yep. That is a big turtle. On the other hand, the smallest turtle, incidentally. Now, I, I the one that I found listed, and I'm sure there are a few around this size. 
Yeah. Uh, but the one that I found listed was the speckled padloper tortoise, which is <laughs> eight centimeters and five ounces. Oh. Just a little tiny. That's just a little like a like what is that's like a third of a pound little tortoise. <laughs> it's so cute. There are also a lot of freshwater tur- turtles, which are probably the most familiar turtles to most people if you live mm-hmm. in a place with turtles. Pond turtles, river turtles, things like that. Uh, like you, you mentioned red-eared sliders. Yep. Uh, red-eared sliders are a unique case because red-eared sliders are native to right here where I'm sitting. Yep. The southeast United States. But they have become one of the most ridiculous invasive species in the world. They are now found. They have been introduced all across the U.S., Mm -hmm. in Asia, Africa, all around Europe, South America, Australia, and even a bunch of islands like New Zealand. (laughs) I I don't, as far as I know, there are no land turtles native to New Zealand. But now they have red-eared sliders. Yep, there's even areas in... Florida, where they're considered invasive. Yep. Indonesia's got them. And we can, it, I've seen it suggested that we can blame the Ninja Turtles for that. <laughs> it's probably not wrong. Because they're in the pet trade. Yep. They become, yep. Uh, and at least one of the, the, the original origin stories for the Ninja Turtles is that they were sliders. Yep. Absolutely. And they, they ran into a similar issue as the uh, Burmese python and that people would buy what they thought would just be a little cute pet for a little while, not realizing that they were going to live a few decades. Yep. And then they went, nope, you go live outside. Well, and that they get big and smelly. Yes. Like they buy them when they're like the size of a, for what would be a half dollar here in the U.S., you know, just a couple inches across. Yeah. And you can get them as a little baby and they're all adorable. And then they get to be the size of, for a female, almost the size of like a, a what's a good, what's a good fruit or vegetable? Uh, grapefruit. Uh, yeah, like, like this. I don't know. I mean, they could get to be the size of a, a cantaloupe. There we go. Oh, that's a good one. Cantaloupe. And then live into your retirement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have a bigger animal than you planned on, and you're still taking care of it on your second dog. And <laughs> you just want to be rid of it because you weren't planning on it. So people just let them go. Yeah, well, turtles live in ponds. There's a pond. Sploosh. Boop. And apparently, at least some of them do great. They are not picky eaters. So s- sliders are now super invasive. There are also more uh, adapted freshwater turtles. So so sliders, you'll see they have webbed toes. You know, they're yeah. land turtle. You know, they're, they're not. They're, they're, they're ad- they're, they can do both. They can walk perfectly fine, but they're also great swimmers. There are also soft-shell turtles, mm-hmm. which are freshwater. So if you look at a slider or your typical pond turtle, a lot of them, will ha- they have hard shells. They're covered in scutes. They have webbed mm-hmm. feet. Soft-shell turtles have taken it a step further, and they actually have leathery shells. Mm-hmm. So it's like the difference between a hard-boiled and a soft-boiled egg. Yeah, texture-wise even. And then there is what might be the best turtle. It's so good. Is... Coret Achilles, the pig-nosed turtle, native to Australia and New Guinea. It is a freshwater turtle, freshwater to brackish uh, environments, with proper flippers. Yeah. The only freshwater turtle that, at least, unless there's some weird one out there I don't know about, the only (laughs) freshwater turtle with true flippers on its, uh, its, its hands and feet. So great. Super cool. And they're adorable. They really are. We saw them. It was, what was it? Columbia, Columbus? I think it was the Columbus yes, Zoo. Yes. So cool. Yeah, they're really neat. Turtles are split into two major groups today. Like I said, many, many families. Two major groupings that are separated by the way their neck fits into their shell. Yes. The rarer group are the Pleurodires which are the side-necked turtles. So if, you, if you've if you ever seen these sort of snaky neck, they have long necks and they bend side to side. Some of them are even called snake-necked turtles. Yep. And when they pull their head back into their shell, the, the neck folds up like a snake getting ready to strike. Mm-hmm. It coils so that the neck sits in front of the shoulder girdles. Yeah. The rest of turtles today are cryptodires or hidden neck where the head the neck pulls straight back yes and if you could x-ray them it coils vertically like a little you know, coils up between the shoulders yeah if you looked at the x-rays for both 
the Pluridire look like an S from above, yep. and the Cryptodire look like an S from the side. Yes. So most of the turtles you know are doing the pulling straight back. Yeah. Every now and then you'll you'll see like the snake necks we we used to have at the the science center side to side folding. <gasps> turtles have a number of unusual characteristics that separate them from other reptiles and make them very unique. Here are a few. <laughs> very famously, turtles have toothless beaks. Like true beaks. True beaks, yeah. They, so they have this horny uh, uh, covering, this sheath over the front of the mouth, the premaxilla, the very front parts of the jaw, that create this beak. Very similar to what you see in birds and in a lot of uh, uh, dinosaurs. You know, tric Triceratops, for example, mm -hmm. was a dinosaur that had a beak just like this. They're one of a few groups of animals that have completely lost all their teeth, but their beaks allow them to eat a variety of foods. Turtle diets are very varied. It is very common for turtles to be omnivorous. Uh, you know, your red-eared sliders, for example, are going to eat all sorts of stuff. Part of the reason why they're invasive. Yeah, if it's in the water. Some, like snapping turtles, are specialized hunters. It's my favorite turtles. They do the thing where they have the, the little lure. Ah, la, 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 la. A little tongue lure, and then they snap and stuff. Yeah. Others are herbivorous. A lot of the big sea turtles tend to focus on eating seagrasses or algae and things like that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of turtles actually will change. So they'll start out more omnivorous, eating more small creatures. Uh, like green sea turtles apparently will do this, where they're omnivorous as young, and then the older they get, the more they turn towards herbivory mm -hmm, as their mm -hmm. main feeding style. And different turtles will have different adaptations. So you'll have serrated beaks for turtles that are eating meat. You'll have shearing beaks for cutting up plants. Uh, which who is it leatherbacks with the throats? Yes, that famously the spikes. Yeah, their throat. If you haven't seen this, just Google it. Google it now. Leatherback sea turtle mouth. Yes, they have all these spines in their mouths and all the way down their throat to help them catch jellyfish. Because see, like you have uh, loggerheads and Kim's Ridleys who are big crab eaters, and hawksbills eat sponges, and green sea turtles are grazers. I love green sea turtle beaks also because they've got like a file inside their mouth to grind up stuff. Uh, and then the leatherback, a bunch of them will eat jellyfish. Like, almost all of them will take a jellyfish if it's available. Leatherbacks basically only eat jellyfish. Uh, they are they are known as, oh, what is it? There's a gelatinivores. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I hope that's what it is. I'm, and if it's not that, it's very close to that. It's they eat gelatinous prey. And when your prey is almost the same consistency of water... When you swallow it to push the water out, you need spikes to keep it from just washing out of your mouth. Yep. So and they act as like valves. Terrifying. That, yeah, it's... Oh. Yeah. But that's not the weirdest thing about turtles. Let's talk about the weirdest thing about turtles. <laughs> Evolutionarily, the weirdest, just the most ridiculous thing that, that uh, turtles have done. One of the most ridiculous things any animal has ever done. Shells. The turtle shell is a bizarre feature. Now... If you now some of our our listeners may have had the opportunity to do this if you've ever gotten just a turtle shell yes. no turtle in it just like an old you know rotted away vacated there's only all that's left is the, yeah there's just crawled away <laughs> they can't do that if you take so the top of the shell is called the carapace the bottom of the shell is called the plastron they have a belly shell they have a back shell if you look closely at the carapace you will see that it is made up of many different bones. Mm -hmm. So like our skulls, right? This, uh, the, the, the human skull is many different bones that fuse together into a solid piece. If you get to examine the bones of a turtle's shell on, on the carapace, you'll notice a row of bones down the center that are called the neurals. You'll notice long bones that form the sides, sort of like long uh, tiles or slats. Yes, like boards. Like wood paneling, yes. boards that form... You know, a, a parallel row of that f goes down the side from the middle to the edge called plurals. And then there's a, a ring of additional bones around the edges, most of which are called peripherals. If you flip it over and look at the underside, you will notice that the neurals have vertebrae underneath them. Backbones. That are fused to those bones of the shell. And if you take a close look at those board-like ones, the plurals, you will see 
that they are indeed ribs. Yes. A turtle's shell is mostly not extra bone. No. Some of them are. The, the ones around the edge, those peripheral bones, those are osteoderm-like. Yeah. Like what, uh, like what crocs have. But the middle section of the turtle's shell is fused part of the vertebrae, and the, the sides of the shell are its ribs. The ribs are expanded. They're lengthened. They're wide and flat. They fuse to each other to form a solid sheet. A turtle has taken its rib cage <laughs> and put its whole body inside of it. It's fortified it. Its limb girdles, its pelvis, right? It, the pelvis is inside the rib cage, yep. and it can pull its head inside its rib cage. Why? What a weird thing to do. Well, and it stands out because there have been armored animals going back through history. But almost every other one that we've ever mentioned, as you said with crocodilians, has been osteoderms. Yes, skin bone. Additional bones that grow in the skin. Armadillos, crocodilians, uh, sloths, sloths, all yep. have grown Ankylosaurs. extra bones on their skin, covering their skin, in their skin, all over. But it's been calcium inside the skin, separate from the skeleton. Yep. Turtles went, well, I already got calcium. We got bones. Yeah. It is so weird. The plastron, the belly shell, is also made of many different bones. There are several different bones that fuse together to make the plastron. Largely thought to be derived from gastralia, yeah. which are, so you see this in, in many reptiles, belly ribs. Sort of like the sternum. Yeah. So we have a sternum, and then it, it, it if you imagine belly, you know, a, a, a sort of like a sternum that extends further along the, the belly. It's if you look at a X-ray of a lizard, it almost looks like they have a normal rib cage and then an upside down rib cage that meets up. Like yes, it, some dinosaurs have this as well, which is cool. I think we I think it was a great oversight getting rid of our gastralia. Agreed. Turtle shells are also often covered in scutes, and what's really cool about this is that the pattern of scutes on the shell is not the same as the pattern of bones. Blew my mind the first time I learned that. So the pl so for example the plural bones on the carapace are covered by costal scutes and they don't make the same pattern. It's like you took two different puzzles and laid them over each other and the pieces don't line up. Yep. Which means two things. One, it adds extra strength to the shell cuz you're double layered and it means that if you look at the bones of a turtle shell, you can see mm -hmm. the outlines of where the scutes sat over, like, the middle of the bones. Yeah, it leaves this little ridges. Which is very cool. Other times, uh, shells are covered in leathery skin, like the soft-shelled turtles, like a lot of sea turtles, leatherback yep. uh, turtles. And in those cases, if you just look at the shell, sometimes the, the, the carapace and the plastron aren't fully ossified. Yeah. So if you look at a box turtle, that is a solid shell all the way around. But if you look at a soft shell turtle, you will see that the the bone the, the ribs are partially expanded and fused, yeah. but then you can still see the ends of the ribs poking out the end of those bones. Which is interesting. It's that they are more quote unquote to the norm with those those turtles with reduced shells. Yeah. Uh and then like uh snapping turtles have these very reduced Plastron. Yes. The plastron is like this little cross shape underneath them, and it gives them all sorts of mo mo uh, motion in the limbs. Because when you're a snapping turtle, you're not hiding from anyone. No, you don't need protection. No. Sometimes carapaces are domed. Imagine your tortoise. Uh, other times they are flat. Like if they, they are like the pancake tortoises, which have these very flat uh, shells. It looks like someone stepped on them. Some turtles can completely enclose themselves in their shells. And in fact, some, like box turtles, the plastron is separated kind of into two, a front and back yeah. piece with a little hinge between so that a box turtle can pull its head in and then the front part of the, the, the belly shell, the plastron, just closes, hinges up and covers his little face. And it's such a perfect seal too. Like you can't even get your fingertips in there. It's really awesome. It's so cool. And then other turtles, like a lot of sea turtles, cannot pull themselves into the shell. Uh, snapping turtles can't do it no. either. There's just, there's not enough shell left to pull yourself back in. Fun fact, 
because sea turtles can't pull their heads in their shell, when they go to sleep, which they do underwater for almost an hour at a time, they stick their head under a rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. They find a hole in the reef and they shove it in there, which means if you go to a turtle hospital where you don't want a bunch of complicated stuff where injured turtles can get stuck, it's just an empty habitat. They put PVC pipes in there for them to stick their heads in when they go to sleep. That's adorable, <laughs> it's, it's and a, I love it. It's this big, like, four-foot-long, a like, hundred-pound turtle sound asleep in the middle of a pool with its head in a tube. <laughs> That's great. And the world goes away now. <laughs> Other famous features of turtles. They are... Now, turtles are in a, uh, stereotypically slow. Yeah. Considered to be slow. Although that's not always true. It's just... If you've ever tried to chase a, like a little pond turtle, they can book it. They're, they, can, they can move pretty quick. It's just that they, when you're carrying a big clunky shell, you can only move so quickly. Yeah, they have sacrificed mobility. Because their legs are also very strangely shaped. Yes. Because the legs have to bend out of the shell. So they have this unusual limb morphology. It'd be like strapping a... a surf or a, bo a boogie board to your chest and then walking around you know yes. with this big flat thing that will not bend will not move with nope. you turtles are also all egg layers yep. so unlike lizards and snakes turtles have not uh ever to, at least you know at living turtles there are no live bearing turtles even sea turtles which is interesting because a lot of ancient marine reptiles are thought to have uh, reverted to a to to live birth. Even uh, modern day sea snakes will do that. Yeah, to completely leave the land. Yep. So, and this is why sea turtles famously have to crawl onto land to lay their eggs. Turtles are famously long lived. Uh, I will, as, as my research, my internet googling <laughs> revealed, the oldest known turtle is Jonathan the tortoise, who is a Seychelles giant tortoise, who is. At l recent estimated age of around 186 years old. Wow. There is a photo of Jonathan from 1886. <laughs> and he he's just a tortoise back then. And he's a tortoise now. He hasn't aged a day. I love it. And there are stories of other turtles, uh, uh, of recently deceased turtles that have gotten similarly aged or older. But yeah, like pushing 200 is not at all unheard of. For a tortoise. Even small species, like the little box turtles can reach 80s. Like, yeah. And, they, and they're, they're no bigger than a, a, a hefty apple. Like, yeah. So it's a little, it's weird. Forever. There has been all sorts of interesting research into how turtles have accomplished this, which I'm not going to talk about at all because <laughs> I don't have time for it. <laughs> it's too much. One of the weirdest things that turtles have had to deal with with their shell. So the shell impedes mobility. It also gets in the way of breathing. Yeah. It's a risk because most animals, most vertebrate animals, we breathe. You have to, in order to breathe, right? When we breathe, we, we do it by decreasing the air, the pressure in our body cavity, which draws air into the lungs. Creates a vacuum. And then we exhale by contracting and pushing it back out. For most vertebrate animals, the muscles that do that are attached to the ribs. Yes. Some reptiles actually expand their ribs when they do the lizards uh, do the lizard. If you feel a lizard breathing, you will feel the often feel the ribs moving in and out. You can feel it a little bit with yourself. Yes. Right. The, the our diaphragm muscles are attached to the ribs. I have kids do that when I'm explaining this part about turtles. Yep. Well, turtles are kind of using their ribs for stuff. <laughs> Occupied. Turtle ri turtles do not have the muscles between their ribs anymore. They've lost them evolutionarily, and the ribs are fused into this rigid bowl. So instead, they're breathing using a muscle that surrounds their organs and pushes against the lungs or pulls everything away from the lungs. Mm -hmm. So they have a whole different muscular setup to allow them to breathe that moves their organs up and down. Evolutionarily... It's inferred that what happened was as the ribs took on more of this support, this, this sort of strong, rigid structure, those rib muscles were no longer needed to support the trunk. Yeah. And so they gradually became repurposed to 
moving the lungs in a, a completely different fashion. That's one of the common questions kids will ask when I'm holding one of the turtles, because if you look at their throat, it's just constantly going, <laughs> just moving up and down a little bit as they're moving air, because their chest can't do that. Yep. Cannot expand the chest. Also, we should mention real quick that there are, in fact, turtles that breathe through their butts. Yay! There are turtles that live in ponds that will hibernate under the pond during the cold times of the year. Some, like snappers and painted turtles, can last down there for more than three months. Right? They just sit down in the bottom for three months. Nestle in the mud. They have all sorts of adaptations for doing this, but one of them is that they have a highly vascularized cloaca, which means lots of blood vessels flowing through the skin, which allows the, them to passively absorb oxygen. This is called cloacal respiration, or, if you don't feel like being sciency, butt breathing. Butt breathing. I call it a reverse fart. <laughs> <laughs> which is also very fitting. So turtles are super weird. They do all sorts of crazy stuff that is not seen in other animals. And because they're weird, like we talked about last episode with bats, like we've talked about with snakes, like we've talked about with a lot of unusual animals, the weirder you are evolutionarily, the harder it is to compare you to other groups of life. And turtles are one of the most famous cases of unknown affinity. Yes. Where do turtles fit on the reptile family tree? is a question that continues to plague us to this day. Now, the reptile family tree is still to this day split into two major groups. You've got your lepidosaurs and relatives, which is your lizards, snakes, two ataras, and then a bunch of extinct relatives. Mm -hmm. And you've got your archosaurs, the good ones. which are your crocs, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, birds, and all their extinct relatives. And then there are a bunch of more basal groups, uh, a lot of early, very ancient reptiles. Turtles have bounced all around <laughs> this tree throughout decades and decades of study. The classic identification of turtles was based on the morphology of their skulls. So some terminology. Most vertebrates, amniotes, right? Reptiles, mammals, birds have holes in the back of the skull behind the eyes that are called temporal fenestrae. Fenestra means hole. Fenestra means hole. In, for example, lizards and dinosaurs, there are two. One toward the top, one, one lower down, two temporal fenestra on either side, two pairs of temporal fenestra. Those animals are called diapsids, two holes. Yes. And this is how a lot of animals were, were defined for a while. Mammals are synapsids because they only have one of the holes. There is a term uriapsids for reptiles, ancient reptiles that had only the other one of the holes. <laughs> Which I love. Turtles are anapsids. No fenestra, no no temporal fenestra. They are completely closed off. They are just a solid, smooth wall back there. This is also seen in some ancient, you know, we talked in episode 45, the Permian extinction, about some of these cool Triassic reptiles, Piraeosaurs and Captorhinids, which are also anapsids. So for a long time, it was suggested that turtles were linked to those ancient basal reptiles because they were anapsids. Mm -hmm. They had that skull shape, which led to turtles being placed way basal on the family tree, outside the major groups that we have today, that they are the outgroup, the weird ones, the distant cousins to everybody else. However, more recent studies have found that that feature, those those skull, the, the, the coming and going of those skull fenestrae, has happened multiple times. Yes. And there is very good evidence to suggest that turtles were diapsids that later re-evolved the closure of those holes. And nowadays, we use molecular comparison, DNA. Yes. Now, you might think to yourself, well, great, DNA is, that's great, because DNA will solve the whole problem. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be wrong. Easy peasy. Various DNA studies have linked turtles with crocs, lizards, outside of diapsids, birds. <laughs> uh, like I said, there is strong evidence, uh, both morphologically and molecularly, DNA-wise, to suggest that turtles 
belong with the diapsid reptiles, which is most of yes. reptiles that we have today. And most recently, the majority of DNA studies keep pointing to turtles being sister, near, you know, close relatives of archosaurs. That yes. is your croc dinosaur bird line. But this isn't necessarily right just because the molecular data keeps saying it. Some scientists are still skeptical because, number one, that's not something we see very clearly with the skeletal information, mm -hmm. a link to archosaurs. And there's possible errors in DNA studies. I think it's easy to, to think, oh, DNA, that'll solve everything. But your DNA data is very limited only to living species, mm -hmm. which means you're missing a ton of evolutionary information. And I thought this was interesting. I read in a paper that DNA comparisons can get confused by things like rates of evolution. Oh, right. So one of the things that turtles and crocs have in common is that they have slow molecular evolution rates, that they change on average more slowly than, say, lizards and yeah, snakes. They, their design kind of fits regardless of the change, changes around them. And not even that, it's just that they are... Sl it's not even that they're necessarily how little or how much they've been pressured to change mm -hmm. it's just that, that genetically they are slower to change they are predisposed to slow and the interesting rate of evolution can leave artifacts in those comparative studies that might mean that they're being grouped together not because they're actually related just because their genetics are working similarly oh so there's so i, I my my money's on archosaurs because it keeps coming up yeah. But we die, we don't know. We don't know. Turtles. Which makes Archosaurus such a odd group to have a turtle, a croc, a bird, and various dinosaurs. Yeah, right? <laughs> Obviously, these go together, right? <laughs> so, turtles are super weird. They're very mysterious. We don't know where they fit in the, in the reptile family tree. So the next obvious question is, well, to sort it out, we just go to the fossil record. Yeah. That'll solve everything. <laughs> Skip on down to the collections. So here in a moment, we'll talk about fossil turtles. <laughs> Last episode, we talked about bats. And bats being next to turtles is actually an interesting comparison because they are both very strange groups of animals with very unique features who we don't have a lot of information about where they first came from. No. However, unlike bats, turtles actually have a really good fossil record for the most part. <laughs> turtles, just like they are today, have for a very long time been super common all over the world. Turtle fossils are, and, and they live, a lot of them, in aquatic environments. So you get all these wonderful sites for turtle preservation. Now, we've talked in other episodes about what elements are best for identifying different groups of animals. And we've mentioned that when you're studying mammals, you want teeth. When you're studying, right, when you do research on snakes, usually what you're looking at is vertebrae, things like that. Well, turtles are weird because turtles don't have teeth. And a bunch of the turtles' vertebrae are fused into their shell and you're not going to find very many turtle ribs lying around like you do for snakes and a lot of other animals. Fortunately, turtles come in a little, perfectly durable, fossilizable box. Right? Turtle shells are very common in the fossil record. At the Gray Fossil Site, we have turtles pick up a handful of sediment, and there is a very good chance you're going to find a piece of turtle shell. Yep. What's really cool is that they disarticulate in a lot of cases. So we mentioned that the shell is made of all those different bones, like puzzle pieces. You will find individual bones from the shell. You'll pick it up. You go, oh, this is one of those peripheral bones off of a turtle shell. This is one of the, the, the plurals, the cost, the, the rib bones off of a turtle shell. And sometimes you can see the lines where the scutes sat on top of that bone. So they're really cool, pretty little fossils to find. Very much, like you said earlier, finding a single puzzle piece. But yes. if you already had the box of that puzzle, so you immediately know which piece it is. Yeah, turtle piece. 
It's really cool. Turtle fossils are found all the way back into the Jurassic and even into the Triassic. But the, the, pl the part where the turtle fossil record starts to break down real hard is in the beginning. We have very little evidence of the origins of turtles. Similar to snakes, similar to bats, not a lot to go on. And one of the reasons, like snakes and like bats, is because there are so many unique features of turtles that are that, that evolved within that group that it's hard to find their close relatives because their close relatives aren't going to have those features. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Over time, there have been a couple of groups that have been suggested to be turtle relatives, but have turned out not to be. Uh, <laughs> for, there's a very famous example of, a, of an animal called Hinotus, late Triassic from Germany around 220 million years ago. This is a type of animal called a placodont, which is a marine reptile, that had these expanded bones off to the side on top and bottom of its body, had a plastron and a carapace. Looks like a flattened turtle with its arms sticking out. It actually looks a lot like those gliding lizards, except that instead of flaps of skin, it's hardened bone that has formed this shell. Uh, there's another very similar uh, animal called Cenosaurus fargus which, uh, and its relatives, from China around the same time, earlier Middle Triassic, also marine, also had these expanded bones, in that case ribs, to form this carapace shell. But closer analysis of those kinds of animals has revealed that they are using different bones to create those shells, which means that the turtle-like shell is something that has actually come up multiple times. Which, what? Yeah. <laughs> I also made a shell. Oh, with backbones and ribs? No. No, I use these. What were you? I, yeah, I use these bones over here. <laughs> no, you weirdo. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> However, there are a handful of ancient reptiles that have been identified pretty securely as the earliest members of the turtle family tree. And they're cool. Stem turtles. Not true turtles. Stem turtles. The earliest of which, and one of the most famous of which is called Eunotosaurus. Mm -hmm. Eunotosaurus is very old. It is Middle Permian, 260 million years old, even before the Permian extinction, found in the famous Karoo supergroup of South Africa, discovered in 1892, although it was not right away that it was realized that it was a turtle relative. This is an animal that looks like a small, wide lizard. Yeah. It's maybe a foot long, and it has this, it looks like a lizard. It's got a long tail. It's got teeth, but it has this widened body. Its mm -hmm. vertebrae and its back are long, which is something we see in turtles. It has expanded ribs. It has paired gastralia, belly ribs, well-developed belly ribs, but it doesn't have a shell. It just has expanded bones in the body. So it has this wide look to it. I, I imagine like um, if you've ever seen the, uh, the, Phrynosoma lizards. Yes, that, yes. That the horned lizards out west mm -hmm. here in the U.S. that'll flatten themselves against the ground and spread their ribs out. It lo lo looks like a lizard that um, swallowed a frisbee. Yes, that is absolutely what Eunotosaurus looks like. Uh, yeah, they're super interesting. But Eunotosaurus also has a similar skull to turtles. Many of the features are similar. And it's it has those fenestrae, those holes in the back, but they're smaller. Ooh. They are on their way, it seems, to disappearing. And most interestingly, I think, Eunotosaurus has a pair... When, we, when, when the scientists have looked at the muscle scars on the bones, the bones of the, the, the torso, the ribs and such, they had apparently already lost the between-the-rib muscles and a, and a lot of the middle, which means that they probably had a breathing system similar to modern turtles. Which is interesting that that developed uh, before fusing the shell and everything. Sure is. Huh. It's, it, what, what's interesting when you start looking at this is that, and like with most animal groups, the characteristic features of this group did not just pop into place all at once. They showed up piece by piece. I'm, and I'm always interested what order they showed up. 
that's to me one of the most interesting aspects of weird groups like this because it's almost never the order if you were asked to lay it out (laughs) it's usually not the order you expect well and also as we'll see here in a second it's not a straight line it doesn't go this feature this feature that feature it goes this feature then this group did that feature and this group did this feature and then this group did that feature again it's like ai learning and you get this what, what's called mosaic evolution the different yes. features are showing up in different groups at different times until one group ends up with all of them and becomes our familiar friends a uh, study in 2016 by tyler lyson 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 sorry tyler et al looked at unotosaurus also to try to infer why the shell began to develop in the first place. As we mentioned before, the ribs, that broadened rib structure, gets in the way of locomotion, and it gets in the way of breathing. But what they showed, but what they suggested that it does, is provides a stable base for powerful limbs. Okay. And they looked at the limb morphology of Unotosaurus and found that based on the the bones and the muscle, inferring the positions of the muscles, they had very powerful arms and shoulders, and they had large hands with broad finger bones and long claws. Oh. Now, until I said long claws, you might have been thinking swimming, because that's all, yeah, powerful arms for swimming. But long claws and, notably, a spade-shaped skull led them to suggest that Unotosaurus may have been a digger. A digger. He's a digger. A fossorial animal. And so they were wondering, based on this, if that might not be why the shell got its start, that the the torso became reinforced to support those powerful arm muscles for digging. Interesting. It would also provide protection, right? You're, You're now widening your body, fill up your little burrow. Yeah, you're becoming a little, you know, digger bot you're in a little tough capsule for digging there are some similar features in other stem turtles as well and speaking of which let's let's meet some of our other famous so that is the oldest member of the sort of extended turtle and turtle lineage when you get into the triassic so the late triassic we see a few others in china at 230 million years old there is a turtle relative named eorhynchochiles which has a very turtle-like skull One of the holes is closed. Mm -hmm. It also is the oldest turtle relative known to have a toothless beak. Yeah. So it had teeth, but the front of the mouth had made that beak and had lost its teeth. But still, Eorhynchochiles does not have a shell. Wide, flat ribs, no true shell. Once again, so weird. The most iconic feature of a turtle is taking longer than you'd expect to show up. Well, it gets weirder. Uh, the prob- possibly the most famous, one of the most famous early turtles, Odontochiles. Yep. F- also from Guizhou, from China, a little later, 220 million years ago, also about a foot long, still has a long tail, still has teeth, has a fully developed plastron. Yep. The belly part of the shell is fully developed. The carapace is not. <laughs> the carapace ha- is partially there. Fully developed belly, partial carapace, which is very strange. Yeah. This led the authors who first described it uh, recently in 2008 to suggest that maybe this indicates that the plastron evolved first for some reason. Mm -hmm. And then there's all sorts of ideas around that. Although other researchers have pointed out that a partial carapace is kind of what we see in a lot of soft-shelled turtles today. Mm -hmm. And Odontochiles is found in marine sediment. So it could be that Odontochiles has secondarily reduced the carapace. Yes. Similar to some marine turtles today and, for, and, and other aquatic turtles today. I've always found it interesting the discussions as to why having a robust plastron and reduced carapace would be useful. Because uh, I've seen a number of, of points brought up. And one of them is the, the slider turtle concept of it was used to toboggan down... Uh, shores and slopes into the water right, avoiding right. predators because that's what slider <laughs> turtles use it for whenever you walk by a pond you hear bloom bloom they go, it's a soup. bunch of turtles just sliding on their bellies back into the water but the one i liked was that it was to uh while they swam at the surface guard from attack from below i like that idea that too. one's really interesting <laughs>
A little bit earlier than that, there's one called Papokiles from Germany, described just recently in 2015, rather similar to Odontokiles, no plastron, mm -hmm. but it had big paired gastralia, had small upper and lower fenestrae. So I said that one out of order, but if you put that where it belonged in this list, <laughs> it would be you'd, that we're, we might be seeing the gradual loss of those holes in the skull, the sort of patchwork development of the shell, and then at the toward the end of the Cretaceous, Proganochiles, it very famously it, long, known for a very long time since the late 1800s, a larger animal about a meter long three feet from late Triassic Germany has a shell. Yes. This is one of the oldest known animals with a true turtle-like shell. It's got costals and the peripherals, the neurals, and it, all the pieces of the carapace are there. It's got all the familiar pieces of the plastron. It has a beak-like mouth. It's lost most of its teeth, although it still has teeth on the roof of the mouth, <laughs> which is common in reptiles. Yeah. Terrifying, but common in reptiles. It is thought to be... A close relative of true turtles. Not quite a true turtle. The teeth are, are one of the features that separates it. It also had its neck and tail were covered in spikes. <laughs> and it had a tail club. Right? A, ta a turtle with a tail club. Why'd we ever get rid of that? It's, it's, it's just so cool. The oldest true turtles come from the latest Triassic into the Jurassic, depending on where you want to think. Modern turtles, the, the, the earliest sort of turtles as we know them today, are around by the early middle Jurassic. Proper turtles have shown up, and then our familiar families begin to show up in the Cretaceous. Yes. Many of our familiar families. Mm -hmm. So we have this transitional sequence of turtle-like forms, somewhat like we have for snakes, somewhat like we have for, for some other groups of animals, but none of those fossil relatives is a definite link to any particular other group of fossil reptiles. Yeah. None of them screams like, oh, early archosaur, early lizard relative. They're kind of doing their own weird things. We haven't yet found what would, what we would, you know, somewhat erroneously call the missing link. Yeah. Haven't quite found that. And so the origins of turtles still kind of mysterious. We have this wonderful sequence of the parts of the shell coming together, the skull coming together, but it, the, even these fossils don't quite help us get where on this tree do turtles fit. Yeah. It's, it's, it's frustrating because we, we are now more and more, increasing our understanding and refining of how turtles came to be the turtles we know today. You know, like we finally have a better understanding of how shells formed and when traits came in, but we still don't know where the first turtle cousins came from. So it's, it's, we have almost the whole map except for where it begins. Right. We have a fully formed piece. We just don't know where it attaches on the rest of the tree, which is and it's it's not even like we've narrowed <laughs> it down that much. It's like, well, these could be like next to crocs or lizards or birds or maybe none of them. <laughs> Going back to our our puzzle analogy that we've been throwing around. It's like when you're you're building a jigsaw puzzle and there's a big patch of like blue sky and you get like just randomly a whole bunch of those blue pieces that actually connect. But now you just have a floating chunk of blue sky. Yes. You're like, does it attach? Yes. Nope. Doesn't attach to that blue piece. Does it attach to this? <laughs> nope. Not to that blue piece either. Maybe if I turn it upside down, I don't know, it's all blue. Oh. Now, there has been some discussion also about where ecologically turtles came from. Mm -hmm. So a common suggestion is that turtles uh, originated in the water. Yeah. This is very attractive because Odontochiles, that famous... Uh, late Triassic turtle cousin is found in, in marine sediments. Uh, some other, uh, you know, turtles are very commonly today and in the fossil record found in aquatic sediments, lakes and such. And then the placodonts, those other turtle like reptiles evolved similar body shapes and they were often aquatic animals. On the other hand, some researchers have pointed out 
that a lot of the earliest turtle relatives, the earliest turtle-like creatures, are t much more terrestrial looking. Yes. That they tend to have short hands. They tend to have osteoderms, which are not common in, in like marine, you know, uh, heavily aquatic organisms. Some of them, like Perganachilles, have tail clubs, <laughs> which are not a useful feature in the water. No. Early turtles are often found in terrestrial sediments and or with terrestrial fauna. So even if it's found in, you know, marine sediment, like near shore, it can be found with land-dwelling animals that are maybe getting washed into here. So there's some back and forth over where do we think that they actually got their start. It, it reminds me heavily of the, the snake conversation. Yes, there's a lot of similarities mm -hmm. here. Because we've pitched fossil reality, like with Unotosaurus. We've pitched water origins, yep. like with Odontochiles. It's very reminiscent of snakes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of our go-to. We're not sure where they started. Uh, water underground? Hmm? It's, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's weird. Those are the two weird places to be. Have you tried those two? Have you tried those were two? They, were they flying? <laughs> are they pterosaurs? Are you sure? Okay. I'm sure if we had pterosaur DNA, turtles, some analysis would bring <laughs> turtles out next to pterosaurs. Absolutely. But once the Triassic came to a close, we move into the Jurassic. Turtles, true turtles, were in place, and they wasted little time in going everywhere in the world. They very quickly, uh, uh, the modern groups are made, you know, pleurodires and cryptodires, the, 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 the one differentiated by their necks, are, took over, spread around the world. A bunch of major extinct groups that lived alongside our familiar true turtles also spread all around northern and southern continents. Both true turtles and stem turtles are found all over the world from the Cretaceous down to modern. Turtles have been a staple, like snakes. Yes. Like crocs. Cretaceous onwards, maybe even a little earlier, you're going to see very familiar-looking groups. Here are some of my favorite highlights from throughout the turtle fossil record to, 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 to bring us home to the end of the episode. The earliest known sea turtle is a species called Desmatocheles padalei, discovered just a few years ago, 2015. 120 million years old from the early Cretaceous of Columbia, about two meters long, so comparable with our largest sea turtles today, mm -hmm. already highly specialized for living in the water. So by early Cretaceous, we had specially adapted marine turtles. Yes. Large sea turtles. There are a few others throughout the Cretaceous. Protostega from Kansas, late Cretaceous which is estimated to have gotten uh, around three meters long. And, very famously, Archelon. Archelon! Often hailed as the biggest turtle in fossil history, known from the late Cretaceous of South Dakota, estimated often at least four meters. God. So for our American listeners, like 13, 14 feet. Yep. Which is just, that's huge. It's, it's... That, that's it's, a turtle the size of an american alligator that's just length it would be so much wider <laughs> than oh, an american it would be so heavy it would be just this giant slab of turtle <laughs> now what's interesting is that uh it has been proposed there is evidence to suggest that those ancient cretaceous sea turtles are not related to modern sea turtles yeah that they are a separate branch a, a separate evolution of sea turtles yeah which is very cool i like when you see trends like that it's getting back to the ocean is is a good idea it just happens over and over mm -hmm. crocs did it multiple times snakes did it multiple times yep. but the large turtles are not restricted to the ocean here's a couple other record breakers carbon emmys from columbia it was a terrestrial slash semi-aquatic uh turtle Estimated the largest specimen at around going on going up to two meters long. Side necked turtle. So this is a huge turtle with a snaky neck. Also, what I like about carbon emmys is that it comes from the Cerahone formation, which means it hung out with Titanoboa. Nice. Yes. Yeah. If you don't know what that is, go back to episode three. <laughs> that was a cool formation. Also in South America, much later, so the Cerahone formation is 60 million years old. In the late Miocene, nine, nine to five million years old, in Venezuela and Brazil, Stupendemes. Which is a great name. 
Yep, a, a freshwater side-necked turtle, uh, the proper freshwater turtle, at two, maybe three meters. So this is an animal the size of a leatherback sea turtle <laughs> in a lake. Yes. Just, just super cool. You can just pick. I can picture so many animals just resting on its back when they're floating around in the oh, lake. Oh man! Just waiting. Do, birds sitting on it. Do barnacles attach to sea turtles? Yes, they uh, must. Right? It's not a sign of. It's not good when they do. Uh, that is a sign oh, of okay. an unhealthy sea turtle. When at least when too many barnacles, uh, it usually means right, that they are right. not s- getting enough energy not to scraping it off to swim fast enough and to scrape it off and get to cleaning stations. Uh, and the more barnacles they get, the more inefficient their swimming gets as they get rougher. So it can compound. Um, uh, so yeah, there's some videos you can find of like barnacle covered. I can't see wow. their face. Uh, uh, and they just, but you just pop them off with a knife. So a lot of people will do that. Oh, that's nice. Speaking of aquatic turtles, my, so, so possibly my favorite group, Coretachelys, the pig nosed turtle. Whee! That family has a fossil record. Thank goodness. Going back to the early Cretaceous. The most well-known of their relatives is from the early Eocene, around 45, 50 million years old, in the Messel Pit in Germany. Yay! Which is a, just a gorgeous, famous Lagerstatten. Beautiful fossils. This is a turtle called Aleochiles, already very similar to the modern uh, pig-nosed turtle. In that formation, there are more than 100 of them known, including 11, 11 <laughs> pairs of this turtle caught in the act of mating fossilized mating pairs of this turtle that's awesome one more super cool group of turtles myolania and its relatives so the myolanians were similar to tortoises some of them got very big similar to very large tortoises this is one of those groups it once again a parallel to snakes in episode three we talked about the madsoids Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that very boa like group that were around in the Cretaceous and went extinct just in time to miss modern humans. This is a group of turtles that did the exact same thing. Originated by the late Cretaceous, existed until a few thousand years ago. Also like the, the Matsoids in Australia. Man, just, just barely, just barely missed out. They were terrestrial herbivores. Uh, the latest of them are in Australia and nearby islands. They have been compared to modern island tortoises Mm -hmm. that they were terrestrial turtles but they were floating around to different islands one way or another and ending up in these different patches of 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 earth which i love the image of of just this bobbing tortoise going between the islands is always so wonderful what's cool about the myelania forms is that they were often big with osteoderms not just on the shell but in the skin they had some of them spiky skulls. Yeah. Like they had these spiky projections in the back of the skull, like a, almost like an ankylosaur. Yeah. Very it, much it like varies. an ankylosaur. Well, uh, and also going back to your, uh, your, your horny lizards, uh, looks kind of yes. like their face, their, their skull. And some of them had tail clubs. Yay. 3,000 years ago or so. We, ch- we just missed these, these turtles. And my favorite thing about this group of turtles is that they include a genus. Now, at one point, I thought this genus was no longer valid, but maybe it still is. Named Ninjemis, <laughs> which is a name that means ninja turtle. And sometimes when scientists give their, their, their fossils super dorky names, they come up with, like, excuses. <laughs> like the guy who did, um, there's a trilobite that he gave it a, its own genus and species name. And because it was from the Han region of China, and it was the only member of its genus. <laughs> he named it Han Solo. Yep. This person, and I actually don't remember who named Ninjemis, didn't even pretend. In the original paper, it says it's named Ninjemis after, quote, that fearsome foursome. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. Yay. And one last note about fossil turtles. I can't, we cannot end the episode without me mentioning that there are So far, as of this recording, two unique species of fossil turtle from the gray fossil site. Yeah. One of them, uh, Sternotherus paleodoratus, uh, published very recently, just last year, I believe, uh, in part by our professor, Dr. Blaine Schubert. Well done. The holotype of that specimen, the original specimen, is nicknamed Old Stinky, (laughs) because it's a musk, it's an ancient musk turtle. And the other one is Trachomys hogrudi, 
Trachomys is the same genus as the red-eared slider, so an ancient relative of the red-eared slider, right here at the Gray Fossil Site, described by our friend Steve, who we mentioned earlier, and named after our buddy Sean. Yes. Whom you heard in episode 13 when we visited the, the prep lab, and who you will probably hear again someday. Absolutely. He's got a turtle named after him. And I happen to know from talking with Steve that there should be some more new descriptions on the way in the not-too-distant future. Excellent. Yes. Well, that's all the time that I have to devote to turtles today. Whirlwind tour of turtles as usual. There's so much more to, to discuss for fossils for modern. Turtles are so weird and cool. There are a lot of really exciting fossils out there we haven't discussed here. But hopefully, those of you who didn't know much about turtles have a new appreciation. Hopefully those of you who are dying to hear us talk about turtles are now sated, <laughs> at least for the time being. And hopefully now we won't have to listen to those I was about to say, those listeners complaining I, about how we don't give attention to turtles. I hope everyone enjoyed this tour of the third best reptile group. Well, I mean, there's dinosaurs. Oh, modern, cool. modern reptile Pterosaurs, group. Pterosaurs. Modern reptile group. Modern. Yeah. Well, two Ataras are really cool, though. Oh, the... Uh... It's, they've got that exclusivity, you know, so. Yeah, they do. Yeah, it's, uh, turtles are a little under the belt. You know what? It's, I hope you enjoyed turtles. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this. I want to give a special shout out actually to Steve. So Steve Jasinski, our turtle studying friend, who provided me with a whole folder of papers. He is a uh, handy background turtle research guide. Here. That's the first, as soon as we decided to do this episode, I was like, Steve, send me a bunch of turtle papers. Oh, I I sent him pictures of a turtle shell literally just about a week ago from my <laughs> friend who was trying to identify one at her, her new job. <laughs> I was just like, I got a guy. One more thing before we wrap up. We have a patron question to answer. <gasps> oh, boy. If you are a patron of a certain level, you get the option of submitting a question to a form uh, at first to answer on the podcast. We've been doing these pretty, re pretty commonly recently because we had a bunch of questions come in. This one... Is a, is a semantics question. I like it. From Sam, who asks, Do paleontologists or scientists of other disciplines refer to other groups the same way they refer to non-avian dinosaurs? <laughs> Do people say non-dinosaurian archosaurs or non-tetrapod fish? Thanks. Love the podcast. Ah, we love you back. Thanks. Uh, the answer is yeah. Yeah. Depending on what the context is. Yeah. It, it's so, definitely situation by situation. The reason that non-avian dinosaurs has become so popular is mostly as an acknowledgement that turtles are di uh, Sorry. <laughs> I'm stuck on turtles. Yep. That birds, that birdles, that birds are dinosaurs. Yes. So for a long time, you could just say dinosaurs. And then as, you know, the 70s happened and we went, oh, well, now that word also means birds. So non-avian dinosaurs is a handy way of basically saying what we what we used to mean yes. when we say dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs. There's there's a little bit of tactical intention in using a term like that because for for a time, at least on the public side of things, there was resistance to including birds yes. among the dinosaurs. Even when it was accepted that there was a connection there, it would be worded as like, and birds who are... Close relatives of... Right, oh, related they, to... They've got some connection. It's like, no, no, no. Avian dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs. Non -avian. A very similar situation happens with the groups of animals that we talked about in episode 47, the early synapsids, mm -hmm. which were, for a time, called the mammal-like reptiles. But they're not really reptiles. It's a misleading, confusing term. So you'll often hear them referred to, and I believe we did this in that episode, non-mammalian synapsids. Yes. They are all the synapsids that aren't mammals. They are what we used to call mammal-like reptiles, but they're the thing. The scientific term for this is stem. Mm -hmm. And we use this, we talked about this before, that you have the living group and all the relatives of the living group that are closest to that group are the stem. So non-avian dinosaurs are stem birds. Yes. Not, not true birds, but they're closest relatives that aren't relatives of that aren't closer to anybody else. All those turtles we talked about, yeah, Unotosaurus and Odontochiles and all those, not true turtles, not related to any other living group, stem turtles. The Using the non-blank-blank blank 
version of the term is more of a tool to help a perception shift. Yes. It's it's a useful public discussion. Yes. We we've reclassified something or we've you know discovered something new that what we used to call you know well it's 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 kind of the discussion we get into at the aquarium all the time of fish. Well fish right. include sharks, you know. Right. So you will say non shark fish. Exactly. Now, we all know when I say fish, you know what I'm talking about usually because right. we call sharks and fish different, but sharks are fish. So emphasizing, you know, that's why we emphasize bony fish, cartilaginous fish, but non-shark fish would be a good way for me to actively make the point that sharks are fish, but I'm not talking about them right now. So it's a useful communication tool both for the public and between scientists if you want to, you know, be more specific about who it is you're talking about and non-avian dinosaurs is a great way to specifically say all right well everything that didn't go extinct yes yes <laughs> all, all those but yeah we do actually we we will eventually occasionally end up using them in different contexts sometimes i'll say non-snake lizards yeah which is mostly to make the point like you were saying mm -hmm. so yeah yes yes is the answer to your question yeah that definitely not as common as you know just describing the two different groups, but it comes up and it's it's very helpful. Thank you, Sam, for that question. Thank you to all of our patrons for their support. Thank you to everyone who requested this topic. Once again, Cheryl, Jonathan, Jaster, Timon, Matthew, Tut, Austin, Bell, Don, and Hans. Thank you for encouraging us to do turtles. This was a really fun episode. I had a, a ton of fun putting this together. Oh, the turtles are so weird and fascinating. Such fun animals. I got to literally yesterday touch our 94 pound alligator snapping turtle i got to pet his shell his name is pepper jack wow. and he it felt like i was touching a rock just like it was just so craggy and well they're covered in spikes and they're like if any turtle is is a koopa <laughs> yes like that's the bowser turtle oh they're fantastic i am certain given how many people were excited to tell us to, to have us talk about turtles, that we have left out things that they would have wanted us to mention. So for those of you who fall into that category, post it. Put it on Facebook yep. or Twitter or whatever. Tell us what we what we left out that you really wanted to hear about. Call us out on where we fell short. <laughs> where we, we, we didn't match your expectations. Because <laughs> as always, I, again, you could do an entire episode, entire podcast about turtles. And I'm sure some nerds will do it someday. Absolutely. The the debate, <laughs> what should and shouldn't be a tortoise and a turtle, and whether those terms are useful, is... Oh, I didn't even mention that. I, I was tempted to bring it up, but every time I thought of it, I was like, that's, that's too long of a topic to just sneak in. In short, it's not really a distinction. It's not really a distinction. It's like frog and toad. It's, it's very much like frog yes. and toad. It's, is it wet? Is it dry? That's pretty much how it is. Yeah. But anyway, let's wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for listening. As always, there will be a blog post mm -hmm. uh, on our blog. Check the social media and the description of the podcast for links to that. As always, the reviews you leave us are very helpful. Questions and comments are, are, are always welcome. Suggestions for more episodes. Our list is ever-expanding. Some of our t topics get lots and lots of requests, like this one did. We release new episodes every fortnight. So keep an eye out later in the month for another episode about something else, something else cool. Yeah. And that's all. That's it. That's all I have to say. Thanks. So with that. Thanks for joining us in uh, the Turtle Club for anyone who watched Master of Disguise. Turtles don't have clubs anymore. That, that's a real that's a real shame that we lost that they lost them. Right. Hey, turtle yeah. enough for the Turtle Club. Turtle, turtle. That was a bad movie. It's so bad, but man, I quote it all the time. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>